Oh, maybe. I might be a bit nicer to Aaron. <laughs> so, Scott, this is the second year in a row you've spoken to us. Yeah, thanks for that. That's cool. Good. I appreciate it. Um, I read this last year and I thought it was funny. Um, Scott Moyes is a proud Cornishman. I am indeed. Really? I'm also a proud Kiwi now, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, and you're at Cadpro? I am. How's that going? Awesome. Yeah. Great company. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> You previously worked uh, Specialist Marine Interiors for nine years. That's a long time. It was. There aren't, there aren't too many companies in Whangarei, so... No. Yeah. You didn't have much choice, right? No, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Very good. I uh, started out as a design support. They quickly moved into programming their CNC machines. Scott worked closely with processes, gaining valuable insight during his final three years at SMI. SMI? Yep. Specialist Marine Interiors. Okay. Yep. Um, and you managed a team of 11 designers. Do they all treat you the way Aaron treated you? Yeah, some of them did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there you go. So uh, only one of four auditor expert elites in Australasia. I am, yeah. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Thank you. Uh, he also regularly contributes to... Designandmotion.net. What's that? Um, it's a blog that was originally started by a guy called John and John Evans in Florida, uh -huh. um, and we generally yeah write about mainly Autodesk software, Inventor, and Vault, um, and a little bit of competitors' products occasionally as well, and some hardware reviews and tips and tricks and best practice. Uh, we haven't actually had a lot of time um, to write posts for the last 12 months, but there is a lot of valuable content there, so it's worth having a look. Very good. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you here again for a second year, and um, I've seen a bit of what you're presenting, and it's fantastic, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. No worries. All right. All right, so um, I'm going to be presenting, uh, in the um, opening keynote yesterday, um, at the end of the first session, there was a couple of slides. Well, there was one slide with some BMX components on the screen, um, and so that customer um, CXP Racing is um, this presentation is telling their story and the work we've um, been doing with them over the last nine months. Well, really, it all started. This stuff started in March this year. Um, he so the company. Um, is run by a guy called Bruno um, Fister, and he's Swiss. Um, he moved to New Zealand about 15 years ago and set up Cycle Express 14 years ago. He, his background, um, he originally started riding motocross in Switzerland, but had a big accident and then got into BMX, ended up competing on the international stage, um, competed at the World Champs. Uh, three times, I think, with the best um, finish of 15th, um, but finished 8th in the European Championships once and raced quite a bit in the States as well. Um, but and So he's, he's been doing that competitively riding right for the last 30 plus years, but and the whole way through he's been tinkering with components and trying to make things better and always trying to find a better solution for stuff. So he's always had a passion, and passion for design and manufacturing in one way or another. Um, so this slide here is just kind of just giving a bit of context at the beginning of the presentation to show that um, what the, the two main components this presentation is about is the crank and the chain ring on this on this BMX. Yeah, so predominantly um, Cycle Express was a, he was doing, doing specialty bike repairs and, bring, and then he started importing components from overseas and he's quite actively involved in the BMX in. Um, culture over there and goes travels around the country with his daughter um, every weekend just about in the season racing and interacting with all of the other people in that community and so there's people have got a huge amount of respect for him and his knowledge and he's just a generally nice bloke so his business is is done really well because he provides just excellent cu customer service um, so uh, I think it was probably about eight years ago he decided he wanted to um, come up with a better um, pedal and he found this company in Taiwan that is actually kind of ahead of their time in a way and um, do a lot of what the future of making things story is. And they provide a service to people like Bruno um, where they've, they've got a number of different components and they can configure them in different ways and then they'll produce them and ship them over um, and put their own company branding on them. Um, so he, this is actually the, the, the best-selling BMX pedal in New Zealand. 
And they picked up on that and, re and used that same configuration and started selling it in other countries around the world. So he didn't, have really, he didn't really have an issue with that, but he knew if he started designing his own components that he didn't want to go to them and get them to make stuff. He wanted to be able to do it in-house. In um, and then there were components like this, which are all well and good, um, but they're not the cheapest of components to bring in from overseas. Um, and for the, for the category they're in, they're not actually the best quality either. So there's, there's some consistency issues. You can see some finish marks. It, they're fine. They do the job, but they could be better. And he felt like he could definitely do better. Um, <clears throat> and then with chain rings, what's interesting, I, I was really shocked when I first looked at these, these chain rings and the various different brands and methods of manufacturing them, how inconsistent the tooth profiles were. So you get increased wear on both the chain ring and the chain itself. Um, and they just don't look as, as you'd expect them to look. Um, there's lots of kind of fragmentation in different systems of how things connect together. So he was quite keen and had a lot of ideas of how to improve that. Um, so about six years ago, he, 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 wanted, he started looking at CNC machines. And it was, about, it was 12 months ago that he finally found the money and, and ju the justification to buy um, a CNC machine. So, he got in touch with the New Zealand HFO and ended up buying a three-axis TM1P. Uh, it was a two, tool room mill. Um, and he needed a CAM system, a CAD CAM system. So he had a look around. He looked at some of the other online cloud-based products and um, that his mates recommended. And then eventually he found um, CAD Pro Systems and Autodesk Fusion 360. Now, I went in there to see him. He offered me a coffee straight away. He's got this awesome espresso machine. So it's like you walk in, it's a coffee at the front, machine at the back. So you just get lubed up on the way in. It's great. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so I sat down and um, showed him some CAD. He, he modeled some stuff up as I instructed him, got him to put some tool paths on it. And um, within two hours, and this guy had no CNC experience prior or CAD CAM, he, was, he used manual mills a lot and lathes. Um, but within two hours, he was running a part on this machine. So he was, he was completely blown away by it and got on board with Fusion um, straight away. He made lots of different components, bits and pieces here and there um, over the next um, nine to 12 months. And um, then we, we were quite keen on doing an event at his shop and showing people around Auckland what he was doing and what he'd achieved in, that, in that, those nine months. So I just, he wanted to make some chain rings. Um, and I, I was quite keen to make sure that he learned how to do it parametrically so that he could type in the number of teeth that he wanted to then, on, on the press of a button, make a custom chain ring. Um, and around that same time, Autodesk um, released, well, it was probably a few months earlier, actually, Autodesk released um, the R2 version of Inventor, and it had Shape Generator in it. And Inventor 2017 came out and it had the next version of that. So I was really keen to try out all the marketing hype around shape generation and see if I could actually produce a component um, using all of, this, all of this technology. So in Inventor, we did some shape generation. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and then designed the whole um, crank in, in Fusion 360. So I've got a little video here that we took during the event. A milling machine sometimes is used to produce flat surfaces. <laughs>
So there were a number of different products that were used in that, uh, in, that you saw in that video, and all of those things came together to give him a solution that he could, it's not just about having a parametric model, you could type in the number of teeth that you want on the, on the crank, you've got to have a whole bunch of other stuff supporting that so that you can easily manufacture these products. So the jigs and the fixtures adapt to the design as well to allow him to make them on the fly. Okay, so with the check with the crank, the the jaws float backwards and forwards to accommodate different lengths and different versions of those cranks. Um, so we had some requirements for that we kind of laid out in the beginning. That we definitely wanted them to be lighter than the existing components he was bringing in from overseas. They needed to be customizable. Um, they had to be easy to manufacture, but uh, considering the fact that we only had a three-axis mill to play with, so we couldn't create geometry that would be um, appropriate for a three D printer. And we also only had nine tools in the tool holder, in the carousel, in the tool changer. So that seems like a lot of tools, but you quite quickly run out of um, tools when you're drilling and tapping and threading, and, and it all adds up. So you had to put a lot of thought into how this, how this component was designed for manufacture. Um, the target market is for kids up to 55 kgs, okay? So they're not high-end, like elite athlete components or anything like that. So we figured that um, 1,250 newtons of load at the pedal would be would cover it more than enough, um, and we wanted to use shape generator. So it's just to talk a bit about the design process with the chain ring, um, I am, I've kind of mentioned it before. John Evans um, from Design and Motion is he's mad keen on his simulation, so. Um, I didn't, have, I didn't have the first clue where to start for the load conditions for a, a chain ring. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite a complicated load case. You probably, it'll be, I don't know what your thoughts are on it, but it's the, the whole, because it's dynamic, it's changing all the time. So he, he decided to focus on just one tooth and see what the, the, the result he could get. And we got some quite interesting results. So this detail down here I thought was, was kind of cool. It's a cool looking chain ring overall. And um, we're getting on the leading edge of the tooth. It was directing us to remove more material away. It kind of made sense, but that was going to be too heavy. I'd actually like to make a chain ring like that one day because I just think it looks cool. But um, so we, he decided to figure out a way of um, loading up all the teeth to see what result he'd get. And again, that's that's all really interesting, but it's pretty much a disaster so far as a um, design uh, for a design of a chain ring. So. Um, then we thought, right, well, let's, let's punch some holes in it and try and guide the algorithm into giving us uh, something more along the lines of what we expected. Um, and it didn't. And it was still too heavy. Um, and it was kind of weird, weird organic shapes. And around the same time, um, an old university friend of mine posted an image of a cast iron wagon wheel on Instagram. And I immediately recognized the geometry um, and, and realized that actually what the shape generation was coming up with wasn't too far-fetched from um, the geometry they had to use like 150 years ago um, to overcome the structural deficiencies of cast iron. Um, but we didn't particularly like the look of that for a chain ring and um, we reckoned we could also make it lighter. So we just kind of went, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Then we got into FEA. Um, thought that maybe we could remove all the unstressed regions and get a result, but again, still going to be too heavy and not really aesthetically pleasing. So we just went back to basics and created a really simple chain ring that was easy to make and would be stable, changing size and parametrically inside fusion. And we figured if we wanted to, we could do FEA later to confirm the design. Um, so I'm just going to show you quickly um, inside fusion. All right, so along the bottom in Fusion, you've got a timeline. So in other kind of more traditional CAD packages, your history is in the browser on the left-hand side, but in Fusion, it's along the bottom. And one of the neat things you can do with it, I'm not going to go through how this was modeled in detail, but you've got, um, some of you may have noticed it in Aaron's video, but you can drag this timeline all the way back to the beginning or, or press um, use the buttons down the end, but you can actually play through the construction of it. So started off with a base sketch, to define the tooth profile and then just started eating away and removing material to form a, get the profile I want, pattern it all the way around. Now at some point in here, let me start adding surfaces in that don't belong to the product but I'm going to use to generate toolpaths that I want later on so I get clean, efficient toolpaths so I can reduce the runtime on the CNC machine. So I can kind of override the, the model and add these extra patch surfaces that you can see um, being added in there all the way around at the moment. Okay. 
Now, um, this is all driven by a series of formulas in here, and there's actually not very much to it, OK? Um, so Fusion will accept all kinds of different scientific, scientific formulas. Um, there's actually a, a page that lists all of the ones that are supported. Um, and I was, I'm not that clever. So I found a website that has got the formula for the tooth profile I wanted, and I plugged it into Fusion, and it makes me look good. So um, now, if I want to change the number of teeth, I can switch over from, say, 41 teeth to um, 39. And it's just going to update. And now all the tool paths that are associated with that are all going to update as well. Um, and then he just hits post process and goes and runs another version of it. Come on, hurry up. There we go. All right. So um, just, it's a really simple change, but hugely powerful for his business, right, and his customers. All right. So moving on, because I'm conscious of time. So the chain ring manufacturer. Um, we started off with a, just, it's a, big, a big plate that's um, got four holes drilled and tapped into it, and then these two clamps on either side. So we put in a piece of 5 mil plate, clamp it down, drill the four holes, and then bolt this plate down in the centre, and then set about r removing all the rest of the material, cutting right the way through, so that these, the second operation is a lot easier to deal with. Um, just got this little video here just showing... Um, the machine running, um, there's no, no sound, but um, skip through it. So he's actually running at a higher feed rate now, he's proved out his program, but here you can see the control just drip feeding through all of the G-code, all of the coordinates, just peeling through the geometry, machining that part out. And um, the end result after the first operation is a fully finished top face. We've run around surfacing these chamfers on the end and then machining this, deburring the part. So it's, you're not going to cut your fingers when you take the part off the machine. And the second op um, has got a different jig. And again, so you can see here that there's a lot of scope for it to expand and contract. But importantly, these bosses in the middle are locating the parts so that we can accurately position where those teeth are and then come back and then remachine the chamfer on this side and also surface a conical um, face on the top of the part. So here's the chain ring that we made. Um, pass it around, you can have a look at the, the surface that's been machined, and you can feel how light it is. So that weighs 70 grams. Okay? It's made out of um, 5, uh, 5083 um, marine grade aluminium. Okay? Um, surprisingly strong, actually, and hard wearing. Um, perfect for that application for those kids. Um, all right, so the crank. I've got a little bit of a video here just to talk you through the process of using Shape Generator in Inventor. So I've imported the geometry that I want from um, Fusion, switched into the, in, um, uh, into the simulation environment, created a shape generation study and just applying the material that I want. Now those materials, you can define new ones and put in all the physical properties and use, use whatever material you want. Um, then the next step is to create a fixed um, region. So this is the axle end of the crank. So I'm pretending that it's completely fixed. <clears throat> and then moving on from there, then I'm going to define the gravity um, and tell it which way around that it's pointing. So down in this case. I just have to reverse it. Um, and next, now I need to apply a load, so I can apply a remote load to this cylindrical face. Now, the pedal's going to be out here, so I need to offset that load out um, and just control the vectors to kind of simulate where the position of the rider's foot on the pedal. Then it's a case of setting up the um, regions that you want to keep, so the, the important parts of the component. So at this end we've got the square taper for the axle and then in here there's this geometry here is here just to support a thread for putting in a, a nut to then pop the crank off the taper when you want to um, change the cranks out. So we, that's really important geometry and we need to keep it. So you can type in values or you can just click and drag and move around and do it visually if you want. And then at the opposite end instead of using a, um, a box we're going to use a cylinder instead. When you present this stuff, you always see stuff that you can cut out of the video that shouldn't be there, right? Um, so, yeah, so now we're just going to define that end and preserve that. <coughs> OK, 
Then, it, uh, so then I want to, you can define symmetry here. So I want the top and the bottom half of this crank to be exactly the same. So the algorithm will go through and just do one side and then mirror it over. And then I just need to define some targets in the shape generation settings. So um, I think I went, I can't remember, was it 40%? Yeah, I wanted a 40% weight loss. And I kind of set the coarse fine option has a big impact on the result that you get. Um, and if it's too fine, it was giving me a theoretically good result, but one that I couldn't machine. So I'm mucking around with the settings, got something that I could use for inspiration in the design. Um, and that's kind of the result. And it looks, it looks weird here. There's a big cutout missing until you realize that there's actually no load coming into the top part of the component. So the load path is flowing straight down towards those taper faces that we defined. So it kind of makes sense. Um, I'm actually going to skip on now because um, of, of time. But the, um, we started off just giving, uh, creating a boundary of where the component was allowed to be in the hope that it would um, give us more of a, a shape we wouldn't really expect. But because it's a torsional load, um, it's, the bigger the box section, the better. So it ended up using all of the material it could in that volume, and it's really ugly. So, um, <clears throat> and we also couldn't machine it. So I opened it up like this to, so that we could um, try and get something that we could manufacture on a three-axis mill. And that gave us that scary-looking thing. So that no one's going to buy a crank that looks like that. Um, and so, so we started thinking a bit more about how we wanted this thing to look and then and guide it a bit further down the track. And so we ended up with something like that. Yeah, we could machine that if we wanted to on a three-axis mill. Um, still a bit scary and maybe would fail, but we can deal with that later on and, and have a look in FEA. Um, so you could just see the gradual evolution of the component. I then moved it out once I was happy and had, was kind of inspired on the shape. Went back into Fusion and started doing some FEA um, and just some static analysis in the uh, simulation environment. And having a look at the results, making sure my safety factors were um, good. I think we have a safety factor of three on top of the 1250 Newton load. So I was pretty confident that I was being safe enough with this design. Um, I don't really want any irate parents coming after me because their kids smash themselves up on their bike. But um, So we ended up with this um, hole that we punched through it. Um, and we wanted to check to see whether or not that would um, behave itself. And um, sure enough, it was. It, it, was, it was all good. It was all within range. But I noticed this um, area of um, stress at the end and, and, and low stress in behind it. And there's some pretty cool tools inside Fusion where you can, um, this, when you mouse over here, these little triangles appear. And you can grab them. And it filters the, all of the triangles in the mesh and only displays what you want to see within that range. And the result is you can get this, you can eat away all of this other material and you see this sort of like isolated lump on the end. And um, it, was, it was a higher stressed region, so I decided just to chop it off and make it um, an, ex a, an eccentric profile instead of concentric. Uh, and then redid the simulation and it was fine. It was actually, actually performed better. There was lower stress in that area of the part now. So I did some other tests to make sure that it was gonna, uh, wasn't going to fail in... Um, with the crank pointing down instead of being vertically instead of horizontal. And that all passed as well. And um, so you can kind of see the inspiration that, I, although I didn't directly use the results from the shape generator, I used it for inspiration and for the design of the component, component that I probably wouldn't have come up with by myself. And we had this, I don't know if you noticed, but back here, um, the, on the top of the component, component here, there was this big, boss that we thought we needed here. But it's actually a nightmare to machine that. It's quite fiddly. Um, and then we realized that there was this flange in here that was kind of redundant. And so we could actually push the whole thing down. But we realized that while we were standing at the machine, about, about to run the first part. Um, and I just went into Fusion and just clicked on all the faces that I didn't want there and pressed Delete. And it healed all of the geometry for me straight away. And all of my toolpaths updated. And I deleted the tricky toolpaths that I didn't want anymore and ended up with this. It was just a complete on-the-fly change, you know. And within five minutes, we'd ended up with a more streamlined version of the component. And just talking, then we were like, "Oh, we could put in these custom caps and put different logos in them and anodize them in different colors." And you know, it just it was a really cool moment um, in the design process. So that was the, that was the end result at that point. Now, um, I don't think I'm going to have time to really do much here, but I will switch back a second.
Um, so this was the second operation. So we've got the two vices set up. Um, these are dovetail jaws. So this end is indexed and static, and it doesn't matter how long this crank is. Um, we change, change the crank length, this all adapts, and then physically on the machine, these can slide backwards and forwards and still capture the crank in the same way. Um, now, coming back into here, um, so that particular crank at the moment is um, 125 mils long. And so if I switch into the cam environment, I'll just show you how easy it is to set up some toolpaths. So create, if we want to create a setup, this is where the G54 comes in. Um, you have to define where your zero point is on your model to then reference all of the other coordinates um, so the machine knows where the part is and where to go. So here um, I can choose to make the G54 sit up in the top left-hand corner of the part, or you know, depending on the orientation. Uh, my X is pointing to the right, my Z is pointing towards the spindle in the top of the machine, and the Y is pointing away from me. I've got a whole bunch of control on what type of stock I want. I can choose from solid, or, uh, but I'm just going to leave relative size stock for the sake of simplicity there. And then I can use 3D adaptive clearing to start roughing away all of the material that I don't want there and get closer down to the, to the job. So um, I can filter through what types of tools that I want. So I only want to see bullnose tools. So it's flat on the bottom with little radiuses on the corner. And I'm going to use this, um, yeah, this is a half inch swift carb. And I can control the boundaries in here um, and override them if I want. But I'm happy with all those settings and the heights. So I can visually control where the tool paths are going to be generated. And in this case, they're going to be between, be between the top and the bottom plane. Um, and it's defaulted to um, the stock top and the model bottom. And on the passes tab, we can control what the step overs are and how deep the tool is going to cut. So um, it's a 12 mil tool, and with adaptive clearing, um, I can go two times diameter in, deep, uh, in depth and then do smaller step over to remove less material each time um, in plan view, but more um, in the depth and feed at higher speeds. So here I can go um, 24 mils deep, and we'll go with, I don't know, a 3 mil step over. I'm going to leave half a mil of stock on the top and on the sides and let it go through and generate. So while that's doing its thing, I can actually come back and do a 2D contour and start cutting the profile around the outside of the part. So I'm going to, instead of using a roughing tool, I'm going to use a, um, a finishing tool and select this profile here. But in this case, I want a machine to not the selected contours, but to the model bottom and go minus one mils pass just to make sure that we cut the full geometry for the second operation so we can get rid of all the material at that point in, a, in an easier manner. All right, so I've now got two sets of tool paths that I can simulate in here. Just let it regen. Yeah. All right, so this is the stock simulation. So you can see it's removing all that material, roughing it all out. Then it's going to come past, get to the end, and do a final finish pass all the way around the outside. Now, if I switch back to the, cam in, uh, the, to the modeling environment, I can now change this over to, say, a 130 mil um, length crank, let it regenerate, come back into the cam environment, we can see that the tool paths need to be updated. All I need to do is just regenerate. There we go. That's good. That one failed. There you go. That's live demos for you. So that shouldn't have uh, that should have remembered that edge selection. And there we go. It's done. All right. So. Um, so you can quite quickly and easily generate custom components of different lengths. Now, here's, um, while I hand these around, you can have a look. I'll switch back to, and I'll show you some of the manufacturing process. Hmm. 
So, oh, actually, sorry. Um, so that's the first, that's the roughing state, and then this is a finished state, um, okay? And then this is the final one about the um, fully finished product. And I'm just going to give you this. If you have a look at the reflection from that business card onto the side of the product, you can see the kind of finish that you can get straight off the machine. <laughs> cool, thanks. All right. So yeah, so the first setup, you can see that it's just roughed everything out. Um, it's not actually done any kind of finish operation yet. And that's the end result. Uh, at this point, then, we've just got this flange left on the bottom that we need to remove and then finish machine the opposite side. So that's where this jig comes in, this fixture comes in. And you can see that the, the component's now in a finished state. No, thread milled, yeah, thread mills are awesome, they're really cool. Uh, and so what, what you can do, oh, no, I'll leave that, I'll talk, talk about that some, some other time. Yeah. Um, well, no, he, they, no, he can, um, it's his own time, right? Yeah. So, yeah, he enjoys doing it, but uh, aside from the time it's taken him to learn stuff, they are, he is making money on these cranks, yeah. Um, so I've got this sort of like marketing section in here just to show you that you can, um, before you've even made something, you can generate really cool um, renderings of your, your parts in, in the Fusion side of things, um, in Fusion 360. So the other guys have shown you that stuff before, so I'll just, I'll just skip past it. But I, I recorded this video of, um, it's not actually a video, it's a web-based viewer, and so I can actually control the um, rotation speed with my mouse but it's fully rendered out a turntable version of one of my images on the cloud. So I did that in about 10 minutes. It's pretty cool, a pretty neat thing to have on your website so that people can really see what your product's all about. Now, one of the, when I started out on this project, I didn't quite realize where things were going with it, but it turned out that um, Bruno had a couple of young kids that um, were competing in the World Championships in. Uh, um, Medellin in uh, Colombia in, at the end of May. So we end, only ended up getting one uh, particular crank length made in time. So um, there was a brother and a sister, Sasha and Jake, and um, Sasha didn't have a crank, but she went on to, uh, she used the chain rings, but she, she won the world championship. And her brother, um, so she's 10 years old, and her brother's 11, and he finished in the top 16. Um, so it was pretty cool to see these components then being used on a, on a global stage and representing New Zealand. I put this slide in here because Australia is right in the middle there. All right, that was a pretty cool picture. And uh, thanks to the, the photographer there, he was I had a, quite an amusing email exchange of him about using free photos. So he's Scottish, so he wasn't too happy about it, but he he insisted he wasn't a. Um, so he he let me have use them for this presentation. It's pretty cool. Um, so this is some photos of Jake um, competing, and you can see the crank. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, this is quite a nice um, dynamic photo of some dust coming off the back of his rear wheel. Um, so Sasha is actually a pretty uh, special young lady. So, um, so she's 10 years old now. She's a three-time world champion. She finished second last year. Um, and she actually had a break. Um, she stopped BMX for nine months and then did a six-week intensive training program leading up to the um, world champs in May and then ended up winning it as well. So. Um, it, was, it was pretty. It was her birthday. It was her tenth birthday when she won it. So that was pretty cool. Um, then her brother's pretty. He's a um, mad keen into his mountain biking. So he finished third in the crank works at Rotorua and um, is representing New Zealand as well in the world champs. Um, and so this is this is um, Jake and their dad Dion in the middle and um, daughter Sasha. So it's pretty. It's pretty cool to see such a dedicated family and you know getting stuck into it and succeeding and really nice people and kids so it was great um, and here's some other cool photos so this is um, New Zealand ahead of Australia okay so um, yeah that was good and then here's um, uh, what's yeah, yeah 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 
And here's, this is Maynard Peel. Um, he, went on, he won the junior world title for New Zealand. Um, so that was pretty cool. One day he might be using Bruno's components. That would be cool. So that's it. All right, I think I blagged it on the time. I did. There we go. All right, so leading on from um, what Aaron was talking about with the old um, Instagram fusion cam challenge, um, I've got some, I've got like <coughs> 14 fusion key rings to give out. So probably don't have time for 14 questions, but who's got some questions? <laughs> Yeah, that was just a static. But so, um, no, there's no dynamic stuff in there yet. Yeah, I imagine with the BMX, for example, you know, they're, they're jumping and they're yeah. landing. So we just made sure that we had plenty of like meat and safety element, the safety factor in there to, to cover that. Uh, the, the neat thing is that the lad got on the bike and straight away reported that um, the cranks were more responsive and he was getting better. Um, and when he was landing, he'd feel the bike better. And at, coming out of the corners, you could feel it picking up. Accelerated better, so which was kind of interesting. Give the guy the key. Yeah, <laughs> you're one of the key. Okay. Hang on, I'll just give you something else as well. Yeah. Um, anyway, there's uh, some cool, cool stories in there about um, Autodesk Cam. Um, right, who's next? I might come in a little bit late to What was the runtime on the on the cranks? Um, so the the cranks. Um, Oh no, yeah, no, he's going as fast as he can. He's doing, I think it's about 18 minutes all up per, yeah. Both operations is 18 minutes combined. And I think he's got the chain rings down to about 12, 14 minutes. Yeah. Same material for both the crank and the uh, it. Yeah, please. Um, so the uh, 7075. Oops. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. 7075T6 for the crank. So, seven, yeah, so aerospace grade aluminium instead of marine grade. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who's who's next? Yeah, so there's no there's no associative um, link between the two. But sorry, there's no associative link from. Um, Inventor to Fusion, that there is actually going from Fusion to Inventor, but that isn't the direction I was going in. Because um, Inventor's got any CAD. And so in Fusion, you can export as a step file, open it up in Inventor, and then if you make a change in Fusion, export again and overwrite the same step file, and the file will update inside Inventor. But I wasn't working in that direction. Does that answer your question? Yeah, just uh, on, think on workflow, the benefits of actually going Yeah. You just go on the last step for CAM diffusion. Well, you've got CAM in you've got CAM in Inventor as well, right? So it's like a big overlap between Inventor and diffusion. And there I'm is. Struggling which I'll one tell you what. I'm going to pat. Can you answer that question? <laughs> it's a difficult yeah. question. There's a lot of crossover between the two products. Yeah, so. Yeah. There's a giant. Why would I use one process? You're the yeah. 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 Uh, it really is about choosing the right application for you. you know, in, some, it's, in most instances for our existing customer base, uh, Inventor is still the primary uh, weapon of choice because mm. it's a much more comprehensive solution. It does sheet metal and welding structures and high-end simulation and a whole bunch of other things. Fusion is a platform that is developed rapidly. <laughs> it's not going to meet the needs of everyone. Uh, yeah, it's really one of those things to make them move too. I'll give you the I'll give you the question. Yeah. From from a, a cost perspective, did it come in with this this product under those imported ones? Yeah, exactly. Sorry, that is a good point. I meant to bring that up. Yeah, so he they are cheaper. He's selling them cheaper than what he was able to sell the imported ones for. Well, that's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Like a micro business type. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there's and because they're quite cool looking parts, there's people are chasing them for him, chasing him for them. So he's already sold out of the first batch and he's getting into making a whole new, new lot now. All he needs to remember to do is have a, a, a tool there to inscribe uh, his, uh, his brand on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Got a question on the back of you, Scott? Just yeah. um, 
limitation as far as the adaptability of uh, number of teeth, what's the range that you can work to um, as far as sprocket size is concerned, and is yeah. that uh, transferable to uh, the BMX? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a formula. So um, the, the tooth profile um, applies to the sprockets as well, but all of the you know, internal sections um, are different. So he's actually made a sprocket and he just used the same model and deleted all the features out the middle, made it smaller and then redefined the features that he needed in the centre. That's kind of the cool thing about it is you build a, build a good base and then you can play with the style and design of the sprocket um, just by adding features at the end of the timeline. So I think he's I think he's done a 47 tooth with that, and that's the maximum size for the jigs and stuff he's got. Yeah. So does, it, does the software uh, adjust the diameter of the chain? Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So he's um, he's done mainly black. He's got some. Blue, red, and orange chain rings there. So, are you having to do further processing to get it smooth enough to analyze it? Um, no, no, it's fine like that, yeah, yeah. It is a bit rough, but you know, you could spend more time, but some people like it like that. So, they like to see the tool pack tool marks. Some people like it like that. Yeah. I've got two questions well, over here. Scott, have you got time to yeah. repeat these? Since we're in Safe Harbor, um, when are we going to see shape generators? Yeah, well, it's definitely coming, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not an Autodesk employee, so I, I have no idea. Yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. By the end of the year. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say that when you um, elongated the crank, yeah. uh, is that going from center to center? Of yes. Yeah. And so the geometric structure in between is what's stretching. Yeah, so I've actually got three different models, so different ranges have got different um, webs in, this, in them, so the longer they are, there's, a, there's an extra web that gets added, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so that the pockets don't get too big. Now, I was going to say, from an education perspective, uh, Fusion looks great, where inventor uses traditionally. Um, there's a limit to how big our IT guys want to make the image when they go to image them up on either laptops or desktops and stuff like okay. that, so they're, they're completely separate programs, aren't they? Yes. So, yeah. You don't have that issue with Fusion because it's in the cloud. No, 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 it's, it's still installed on your... Yeah, but with the, with the, with the like works or something, the whole program is on the machine. Yeah. So if you've got different, if you've got variants in, in the spec of the machine, you have a problem with Fusion. It's so light on the machine, you also have that issue. Right, right. Well, I'm just I'm trying to weigh up whether they have both installed on the same and how much extra? I've already got one. It depends on um, IT support. So it could be a person perspective. Um, there's been a lot of issues getting from a two weekly release cycles and having um, your IT um, unit push that out to you know, 400 computers, um, different models and things. But the way to do that uh, is a positive problem. Is there any more hardware hungry than Inventor? I guess not. No, it's got to be a 64-bit operating system. Um, the graphics card does have to be out of this world. Um, it doesn't work on Mac. Um, <laughs> I have said that, haven't I, Scott? But, um, I think you made it quite clear. Look, where, where we get stuck in, in the Victorian system is our um, internet's 10 years behind. And, just, and Fusion's constantly updating, which is great too. So someone will have a, might have a bug or get fixed, and so I'll push out an update. And my IT guy is ready to slash my throat because the poor bug has got a... It, our school system won't allow that computer to update by itself because it's all firewall protected. You know, God forbid, I think they think we're easier, you know. So if you want really good internet speeds, you can just apply from residency in New Zealand. And <laughs> you know, that. So I'd, I'd like to point out too, if you're starting to use Cam School, so at Harvester we actually use Scott and, and the CAD Pro boys in New Zealand. We um, what, what do we call you? Our, our vendor, I suppose. So, so I've, yeah. numerous times I've got... Scott's forgotten more about CAD CAM than I ever know. So when I get stuck, he'll do a remote takeover, which is quite frequently. <laughs> no, he's done it once or twice, and he'll take over my screen and fix my problem. And you, I usually get caught out with some 3D stuff. Because it, yeah, it's 3D, 2D minimaling is really easy. 3D stuff's a little bit um, hard, especially when I put boundaries in and that sort of thing. Yes. 
yeah, and work holding them. Um, just on the on the hardware thing, we did a, a training session at Hornsby Girls High School, and um, the uh, IT guy had specified the most pathetic notebook computers you can think of, i threes with um, Intel HD graphic um, chips on them, so no separate graphics.